my chances are so much higher to fight for what's better. But we don't do that because we become capitalists. We say, well, you know what? I got this house. I got this TV. I got this car. I'm okay. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I have a partner. I like them. Uh, I'm just not going to go down this road. I'm okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that they always say about climate change is that they gave us too much of a heads up, I guess, in a sense. Like it wasn't, it wasn't alert. It wasn't alarmist enough. <laughs> It's like, oh, in 30 years, it's a problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that, and, and that's what happens, right? When they say in 30 years, it's a problem. We wait until we're walking on lava to say, okay, this burns. Hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the show where I talk to a variety of people to spread progressive politics, left-wing philosophy, and critical thinking. <laughs> so you can tell my brain's not a fully on right now because I couldn't remember the last part. But uh, And today I'm joined by Ali. Uh, I apologize. I Your your last name is Horiat? Perfect. Ah, See, okay. got it on the first go. So you're all there. Don't worry. <laughs> <Good on. laughs> and and you are the, uh, I guess the creator and uh, I guess president or runner of uh, Compassi- Compassivist Let's, Publishing. You also got that right. Yes. Well, Compassivist Publishing is part of uh, the Compassivist Octopus, which holds the foundation and the movement and the art program and the music program. We've got eight uh, tentacles essentially uh, attached to the body, which is the society, the movement, and which runs through the foundation and out into the arms where Compassivist Publishing is one of, yes. Okay, very cool. So I guess uh, that's kind of just the basics, but kind of what's your story in a sense? Anything you want people to know about you? Um, anything I want people to know, uh, no, I want people to know about the movement, not about me, but <laughs> okay, um, okay. how the movement started was, uh, I used to be in the finance world. So, um, I used to be pretty successful, uh, in the finance world. And, uh, one day I quit and, um, I quit and I decided to, um, change my life around. Um, it, it was just not the happiness that I was anticipating. And I realized um, I was addicted. I was addicted to money. And it's something not a lot of people uh, understand. You know, you, you can be addicted to uh, drugs, you can be addicted to uh, many different things, uh, but not generally, people don't say I'm addicted to money. But I felt, uh, I realized that I was. And I realized that the stories that people were sharing with me from rehab and all the other things that they've gone through to restructure their lives was resonating so much with everything I was going through with money. And so I realized, wow, you know, um, there's a case there. And so I took five years, uh, traveled, um, and, uh, you know, lived among different people, different environments, uh, all around and, uh, came up with the idea of Compassivist, um, and the term essentially I realized to make a difference and, and to have a better world, you need to be involved. You can't sit back and expect things to just happen or work. And you can't sit back and expect the person who is uh, paid to work at that space to make things better, to be the catalyst of it, and you just enjoy the benefits. So, Mm -hmm. and where change comes from is essentially compassion. You You need to feel something about, you know, you need to have that passion to start with. And because the world today is in this destructive uh, manner that it is really you need to have compassion, whether it's for animals, or whether it's for the situation of the planet environmentally, whether it's for people, the uh, inequality gaps, uh, you know, the oppressions, uh, uh, the security problems we're facing, the refugee problems we're facing, all of these things. So um, you need to have compassion. And that compassion can only make a difference if it's activated. If, uh, you know, mm-hmm. if me and you speak for the next six years and do nothing about all our ideas, even if our ideas are the most genial ideas in the world, nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to change. We could be Socrates yeah. and Plato sitting here talking, but if we only speak for the next six years, the world will deteriorate. We will be extinct while we're having this conversation. So it's mm-hmm. really fiddling while Rome burns uh, when you just speak. 
But when you act, it becomes the change. And so I believe compassivist is a you know a joined word, meaning the compassionate activist. And so I started okay. the movement based on that, based on taking our politics, taking our spiritual understanding of what betterment is and using compassion as the guide um, to every action we take. So instead of thinking, this is profitable, we should do this. No, this is uh, going to make the world better because we look at things from a compassion perspective. Right. No, I I, I can understand that. That's that's interesting. I, I'm so... <laughs> when you were talking, I was thinking like, uh, it's kind of like our, our whole society, all of the world is addicted to money. <laughs> like, Essentially. Yes. Essentially. Yes. I mean, um, when you talk about the addiction to money, I mean, uh, the reason we're in the mess we're in today is because we took capitalism out of context. Um, you know, a lot of people find fault in the concept of capitalism and they blame capitalism, so to speak. And it's, okay. so it's used in the, uh, discussions as uh, you know this negative connotation with the identification of the word with the with the uh, you know the meaning of the word but if you go back and you look at the origins of capitalism it wasn't to build empire it wasn't to be a billionaire it was none of that it was just to give people enough resources so that as they competitively push each other to bring out the best solutions for the common good of the world they are being um, funded, so to speak, or they've been, you know, provided the resources to be able to do that. So if you have, you know, Einstein in a lab where you give Einstein all of the needs, if you have Mary Curie in the lab and you give her all of her needs, they're going to come up with these beautiful things that are going to advance us, right? Mm -hmm. You give you give Apple the money that Apple needed to become Apple. They give you all the tech you have today. So right now, which is actually take, what happened, right? <laughs> exactly. Which is, which is exactly what happened. And, and that kind of capitalism to drive betterment for the universe is good. But what happened is people started noticing that, hey, in my capitalism, there's opportunism. So there's, you know, mm. uh, opportunity involved. And the opportunity is valued through money, through currency. And so if I now stop thinking of, you know, how I can make the most sustainable, um, you know, T-shirt um, uh, in my neighborhood and sell it in my neighborhood, I can now go to China or Vietnam or other places and India and induce slave labor and do all of these things that will make that T-shirt, you know, cost the less amount possible. So really, slavery was a part of that. You know, we brought in a labor force to North America that would essentially put a number, you know, minimal for the cost of labor because you didn't right. have minimum wage, you didn't have any of those things. So what happened? My profit became higher. So it all became a matter of profitization. And because we went into that profit understanding of capitalism, we destroyed capitalism. And how did mm -hmm. that happen? By the um, addiction to profit, right? The addiction to money caused the destruction of capitalism. So it's kind of like you know, you have a beer once a month at a, at a game or something, it's not going to kill you. It'll, yeah. it'll probably never kill you. But if you have that beer once a month now, once a week and slowly you're like, oh, this is really good. I'm going to have it daily. And then you know what? I love being drunk. I'm going to have it every minute. Then you're going to shift yeah. from yeah. the beer at the game once a month to being an alcoholic. And that's where the problem comes. So yeah. that's what happened. There was no control mechanism, so to speak, to deter us. And so now we're at this place where we're addicted to money and we destroy everything. Just like having, you know, if you have a cousin who's addicted to, uh, you know, any disastrous hard drug, you know, and you allow them in your house, you're going to have to deal with your TV missing one day and, and all these things happening. So it's the same thing here. We're, we're just destroying mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. So I guess uh, we kind of covered your political ideology. You said it's compassivist or compassivist. And uh, yeah. So I, I guess, and you also kind of described it, but how do you manifest that within your actual like day-to-day -day life? So day-to-day -day life um, on two levels. Um, one is on the personal level, uh, which is basically your lifestyle. And again, uh, this is controversial in a way because uh, I'm a vegan, but when people okay. ask me, what is a vegan? Um, you know, uh, I tell them it's not that, 
it's not about not eating animals. It's not about uh, you know the the avocado toast situation because that itself is so destructive, right? You you gotta you gotta mm. watch where your food is coming from. Veganism is a protest lifestyle, is an activist lifestyle. So when I don't buy um, leather shoes and I buy you know um, say synthetic leather shoes, I have to think, wait, what is this synthetic leather made of? How much oils are in there? What you know, process of production is that because if I care about the animals in the jungle or in the forests, and this non-leather shoe, this synthetic leather shoe, is destroying more trees, more ecosystem, more habitat, what is the point of being vegan? I might as well just eat that one cow that is less destructive than killing a whole forest because of my supposed activism, because it's an uneducated activism. So on the personal side of my life, it's about education. So compassion comes in through education because I educate myself as much as I can to every consumption that I have. So everything is mindful, which is driven through this, uh, you know, gateway of um, using compassion as, as the way you think about everything. So really, if you want to think of it on a broader level, is the Jesus mentality, you know, uh, try to love everyone and try to do everything out of the gates of love as opposed to any other uh, ideology. Now, on the other side of it, um, again, education plays a really big role in um, compassive East mentality. And that is in your work, in your business, in your uh, dealings with people, you know, everywhere outside of that personal space, you have to essentially know that you cannot just take um, decisions and choices and measures that affect the profit margin or the profit line of the work that you're doing or whatever you're involved with. And this goes not just to entrepreneurs because people generally attack them or the 1% or, or that kind of mentality, but it also goes to everybody in the sense that an artist today will say, you know, my expressionist opinion of stuff is going to be about a certain thing. But what I'm going to do because it pays well is I'm going to live in New York and paint people's dogs on portraits. And that's going to go on a gallery because that's kind of what is trending right now. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the trending thing because it'll pay the bills and I'm not going to do what I believe in. And so, you know, you're not going to have Picassos anymore because right. they weren't doing the trending thing. And so uh, the hypocrisy, walking away from hypocrisy, using compassivist mentality to be honest with yourself, to be honest with your dealings, to be honest with your views and how it impacts the world from the gallery owner who says, no, I'm not going to be part of the trend. I'm going to allow artists their own voice to discuss and showcase the social issues that they're dealing with and they want to reflect. And the artist who says, thank you for providing this space. I'm going to now be an advocate and stand with you. And here's my painting that goes into that space. So it's a communal yeah. vision of a collective working to a better future. I, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I often like, I think of like, when it comes to like, if we're talking about artists, often artists, when they do that stuff to like pay the bills, they don't really have any real other choice, right? Because of the right. dynamics of our society. So it's always, it's a, it's a tough position to be in when you're creating things that aren't selling because that's not mm -hmm. what's trendy or popular. Mm-hmm. But that's where that's where the community comes in, right? That's where the collective comes in. So yeah. if the collective was going to say, no, we're not going to give into the trend issue or we're not going to give into, you know, uh, what uh, what is essentially, uh, you know, moving through powerful media and influencers and stuff, but we're going to allow people their natural voices, then you will have this, you know, beautiful symphony of voices coming out from all sides. And there is a lot more ability to then have a democracy because when you allow that freedom of expression, essentially, um, mm -hmm. you allow people to feel comfortable to express rather peacefully. But when you trend and you have a mainstream, it means everybody who falls off of that mainstream is now not selling. So there's a lot of friction. And in a place, for example, uh, like the United States, where the elections are you know, 49.5 to 50.5, it means half of the country is essentially not in the mainstream. It's no longer 10% were you know, off. L let's just push them out uh, to the West. Let's just put them in California or somewhere. No, it's right. half of the country is essentially off. So what are you going to do? So that becomes the problem of uh, 
not allowing people that. I, uh, yeah, it, it's tough because the way that things have been set up, right? Like because the the, the people who own the media, the people who exactly. own, decide who's trending or what's trendy, are, they only have, you know, they don't want to allow outside voices or they don't want to allow mm -hmm. anything that's not right. profitable for them. There you go. So that's that's again the addiction to money going through media. Going every every place has that. The you know auto industry will have it. The aviation industry, tourism, every you know industry you look at is based on this addiction to profit. So right. um, you know in in that concept, you kind of kick away everything that is valuable for the purpose of everything that is most profiting. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I'm really into the idea of the collective and like. Uh community decision making and communities working together for the betterment of the community and mm -hmm. whatnot. But it, it seems like it. And I mean, I do my share of propaganda. I try to <laughs> promote stuff, but yeah, it's, it's tough to get a voice. Like, uh, uh, I guess my, my local reading group was just reading manufacturing consent by Noam Chomsky mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his co-author. And, uh, yeah, like the power that is the owning class or the people who have the most money and that that stop us from actually having a voice larger than that it's it's quite da daunting i guess right but you also have to look at it from the perspective that we are the people who allow that voice to exist i mean if i'm not buying and if i'm not working in the trending then i'm one person i will be unsuccessful but if yeah. myself, Corey, and Corey's reading group, and everybody we know, and everybody that they know, and everybody that they know, that becomes the whole world. So you know, um, to it's 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 the same issue as going back, you know, in uh, thousands of years in slavery. I mean, the people uh, of Egypt could have rebelled against Pharaoh if it was. Uh, you know, the ability of a collective to think about coming together and doing that. But they never did because yeah. the fear of each person individually rebelling uh, is suppressed by the power that they're rebelling against because they, yeah. people, you know, we, we, our minds are not connected in that way. My mind and your mind are not, you know, connected in this sci-fi way of some of the alien civilizations we have in sci-fi that are connected into one mind, right? Right. But if we yeah. were able to connect into that one mind, then collectively, there's no force greater than the masses, which is why and, revolutions happen. And in fact, the Egyptian workers did revolt when, when they didn't when, give them their food and their beer. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what happened, right? So eventually, the revolution happened. Eventually, you know, the pharaoh um, left. And every revolution is like that. Eventually, you get to a point where, you know, dying today with the chance of possibly not dying and succeeding and getting food versus dying tomorrow for sure puts you in a predicament. Well, you know what? I have no tomorrow, so I might as well. And that yeah. mentality should come so much earlier. It should come right, at a point right. where I have a little bit of resources. Now my chances are so much higher to fight for what's better. But we don't do that because we become capitalists. We say, well, you know what? I got this house. I got this TV. I got this car. I'm okay. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I have a partner. I like them. Uh, I'm just not going to go down this road. I'm okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that they always say about climate change is that they gave us too much of a heads up, I guess, in a sense. Like it wasn't, it wasn't alert. It wasn't alarmist enough. <laughs> It's like, oh, in 30 years, it's a problem. Right. But yeah. And so that, and, and that's what happens, right? When they say in 30 years, it's a problem. We wait until we're walking on lava to say, okay, this burns. I need to do something about it. Oh, but, dang. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. But right now I'm walking on concrete that's still cold. Let me figure out how I can maintain this. No, that's not an issue because it's not prioritized because right now yeah. I need to chase money. Right. <laughs> yeah. The economy, the economy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And that's why everything becomes secondary. So I, I haven't really heard of your, of Compassive East before. Uh, so have you uh, had much luck getting this out into the world, your viewpoint? Uh, yeah, we, we've had luck getting it out into the world. Um, the idea behind Compassive East is not to have a, see, 
the thing is, when, when you ask a question like that, it essentially means um, if mm. Ali Horiat has 100 million followers, then Compassivis is successful because that's the measure that we go by, right? Wow. I mean, sort of, yeah. I mean, that's not right. necessarily what I mean. But yeah. No, no, no. But, but, but I'm just saying that's how we look at things. But if you think about, for example, Karl Marx, right? Right. Um, the, the communist movement, essentially, Russia, you know, USSR, all these other uh, revolutions and everything that happened in the Eastern European bloc and other places in the world that took on this uh, China, Cuba, different versions of this, they essentially worked from his political perspective, which is a social perspective before political, it's which is a humanitarian perspective before social even. So it's not right. really political. It's, a, it's, you know, it's a social order restructuring. And they looked at that and they took it up. But never was he a president or a prime minister or anything like that. You know, he yeah. died well before any of this could happen. And even if it did, he wasn't placing himself in a position of, I'm going to be the leader of the movement and I want to take the world over, right? Yeah, so right. In, in that sense, Compassivis is not about follow Ali Horiat. It's about let that concept of Compassivis simmer within you and so you become a compassivist as a person when you understand that the way to change is for yourself and your collective that you can influence be able to make that change. So I recently found out that there are people in Brazil who have a compassivist branch uh, out there and uh, they're supporting, it's a bunch of lawyers who are supporting um, women who are going through domestic violence, uh, you know, and they're doing pro bono work mm -hmm. for them and, and they're helping, you know, hundreds of women a month. And so from Compassivist Foundation, we decided to support them and, and connect with them and to essentially um, raise funding for them so they can help more people. And really, you know, that kind of coming together, a decentralized version, means that now you have that Greek democracy where, uh, you know, take away the bad parts of it, of course, but uh, keeping the good things of the Greek democracy, which is the, yeah. the, the, ma the mainstream idea of Greek democracy, where everybody has a vote, which was not the true. Rule by oh. demos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that was the idea, right? The, the, the idealistic version of it. Um, that's the way we want to be. We want to be that idealistic version of the Greek democracy where everybody really has a say. Everybody has an input. When you have an input, you're having a say. So uh, do we have success? Yes, because uh, I've heard of Compassivis from Australia to Alaska. But does Ali Horiat have success in uh, being famous and, you know, uh, having celebrities take pictures with him? No, uh, Ali's not, <laughs> uh, you know, celebrated in that way. So, right, right. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, I, I I find that if it's the ideas that are getting spread, like like I I promote what I my version of what is anarchism, right? Like, mm -hmm. which seems pretty com, com like uh, compatible with your compassionate yes. uh, perspective. Uh, and so when I see people that I don't, you know, that I didn't tell about anarchism, talking about it, I get excited because this it's about the ideas. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about naturally. Yeah, Naturally, so it's yeah. good. Yeah. So I guess, have you encountered pushback from like uh, anti compassivist people? Yes, yes, yes. And and you know what's funny is sad. Funny is that um, I've encountered this push more from people who are supposed to support as opposed to the people that you're expecting to push back. So oh, okay. when I talk about environmental issues or when I talk about, um, you know, uh, for example, you know, we had this campaign about um, ethical banking. Uh, you know, if you're really going out there and protesting things, the first thing you should do is watch where your money's going. Because if you're banking with, you know, HSBC, for example, which funds the most fossil fuel projects in the world at this point, um, where you, when you're putting your money in there, even if it's an account with fifty dollars, uh, you know you're an, another subscriber into that system. Yeah. Educate yourself. You know, look at that bank down the street and say, "Hey, they're a green bank," or you know, they're doing this and that, or they have certain policies and mandates. Even if they're hypocritical about it, that's fine. At least they are trying. Uh, you know, at some point. But when a bank comes blatantly and says, "Hey, we're in the fossil fuel business. That's where it is. We don't care about the environment." you putting your money in there is a problem. So, uh, you know, at that point, I feel like that's where it boils from. So, you, you know, you, you have to, you have to do that. You have to make that uh, pledge uh, with yourself to 
adjust your corners first and then you know you, you go from there so i was expecting people from these far places like hsbc not necessarily hsbc but you know th that area to come back and fight me or you know the far right to come out and fight me and stuff but it wasn't it was never like that it was more the capitalists within you know our own community who are like hey right. this is dangerous because yeah th you know th this person is going to ruin my capitalism within this space so there are people out there who are saying oh come put your money in our fund because we only um you know uh invest in uh green tech and we're on the nasdaq and we're the first company on nasdaq to be a green only fund and blah 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 and i say to them why are you on nasdaq because they also have all the fuel company uh, you know oil companies and yeah. the energy companies and all the bad guys so you're essentially giving them profit by existing on that platform and why don't you then you know say we refuse to be on the platform where it promotes a b and c that are bad oh no you know well, you have to play in that space so compassive is publishing i'll give you an example we only do um online uh digital books we don't do print and and right. you know that's that's because um regardless of the sustainability of print this is a fact 89 percent of any piece of paper that you touch is illegally locked oh, and and every book that's bound bound anywhere in the world will have an aspect of um slave labor uh, in some definition of it whether because you don't know the that source of the really glue, you don't know the me, actually yeah. right and so because of that i can't print a book and ensure uh, whether it's the glue for the binding or the staple or whatever it is, or the paper itself is 100% ethical. So I said, guys, my authors, you want to come on board, come on board, but we're ethical as much as we can be because we're not taking profit into account. We're losing about 70% of the sales share because you know they're still paper books, but we're trying to make a difference. And, and when we're doing this political stance where we're saying, this is why, fix the illegal logging, fix the child labor, and we'll gladly print publish, but until that is an issue, we're going to protest. So then come the people who say, oh, you know, um, we don't, we don't want to be, we're writing about uh, sustainability, but we don't want to be in your program, in your publishing house, because, you know, Random House Publishing is giving us a deal with marketing where I get to travel all around the U.S. on a chartered flight, uh, promoting my book and doing readings at bookstores and signing and things like that. And they publish 1 million print copies and they've promised me a bestseller position spending millions of dollars because that's what gets you a bestseller. So, right. and you're writing about sustainability. How are you writing about sustainability and doing this marketing spiel? It's full hypocrisy. So I get yeah. challenged more from capitalists within the industry that are supposed to be the people changing the world than I do from the people who are flat out honest. They're like, look, I don't care about the environment. I'm working towards my Porsche. You know, I have a fund. I'm trying to raise money to buy that Porsche. I really don't care about you, your activism, the environment. I'm on. I like that person because you're honest. You're standing in front of me. You're saying, look, this Fair. is my position. I have a I have a right to this position until it's illegal in society. It may be immoral, but it's legal. But the other right. person is coming around to me and saying, I'm going to be a hypocrite. I'm on your morality. side, but <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be a hypocrite of morality. So I'm really destroying your morality because I'm teaching people within the morality sector how to be immoral under the label of morality. So it's kind of like the the way the food industry is cheating the food labels, the nutrition labels, right? Yeah, that is yeah. worse. That is much worse than the people who come out and say, "Look, I'm selling you poison, but it tastes really good. So if you're crazy, have it." That's that's cigarettes. You know, they come yeah, out, they tell you, right. "I'm selling you poison." If you want to kill yourself with it, go ahead, go ahead, be my yeah. guest. You know, here's yeah. a bottle of vodka. Go ahead. You know what it is. I'd rather that than, than a guy who's saying, this is orange juice. It's really good for you. Drink it every day. Drink two glasses every day. But then you become a diabetic. Yeah, I, I can understand that. It's, it's, I think there might be some nuance to that, right? Like there's degrees to which, because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's, uh, unethical practices within the production of uh, computers and tablets and phones that are also reading digital books and whatnot. And like, so it's not like you can get away from it entirely, but you can, maybe you can nuance, you can 
you know, measure, have a more measured way of doing things. What, what you just said there is also um, something that um, I find happens because of the way uh, our media, you know, makes its way into our minds. So when people say to me, but you know what, Ali, to uh, the digital book, you still have to buy an e-reader to read it. I say, why? Why do you have to buy an e-reader to read it? or an ebook thing or whatever. And why don't you have a laptop? I mean, you're just talking to me on something. I mean, it's working, yeah. it's functional. Read yeah, I don't it on need there. a new device. <laughs> right, exactly. That's the that's that's where it is. So the industry comes out, the paper industry came out and they said, guys, we need to get some scientists on board. We need to pay them a lot of money. We need to put out some, you know, a report about how uh, ebooks are disastrous for, for sustainability and, and the environment. Because, you know, we're starting to lose, we, we've lost 30% of the market to e-readers because before there was no such thing as digital books. We had a hundred percent. Now it's right. 30%. Not only are we involved in it because they're doing it. I mean, all of the guys who are printing are also selling in digital, but also we need to make sure that we keep our print because there's more profit there. That's the catch. Right, there's right. more profit there. So we need to put these reports out. But I say, hey, you have a f most people have a smartphone today. Most people who are going to yeah. read your book have a smartphone, if Already, not all, yeah. Yeah. right? Use that. So when you start telling me that new device, I start saying, no, no, no. And then come, you know, the people who are making those devices to say, you need it, you, you need an e-reader. You need this with the well, anti-glare yeah. and all these other things, because, <laughs> you know, when you're, when the sun's hitting, you can't read on your phone and, you know, God forbid. So you need to carry five <laughs> different pieces of equipment just to buy this extra yeah. digital book. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I read a lot of digital books and I read a lot of print books. So it's like, yeah, I, I, uh. I have no problem with digital books at any stretch, but, and also you can often keep the cost down that way too, right. because so then the consumer can access it easier, even if they don't have the money to buy a, a print right. book. And also the issue with the print books is, um, you know, there isn't a big market place for sharing your books. I mean, you, you have all these books, uh, you know, in the shelf behind you and, yeah. um, how often do these books circulate? How often do they come out yeah. and they go around your uh, city even, you know, for people to have access to? Because you read the book once. You're not going to read it every other week. You know, you may right. read a yeah. book twice if it's really interesting, but not five times. So no. after you've made that once or twice, can you not share it with your community? And then people for say, sure. oh, but what about the author and, you know, the sales and the rights and all those things? And I said, well, that's what it's about. That whole, you know, protection issue is about profit before compassion. Right. Books should yeah. be open source. Yep. Essentially, education should be open source. There should yeah. be, you know, a free access to all for education. So an author should technically, in a perfect world, write the book. If the book's valuable and publishable and worthy of its place, then there should be a body that says, okay, here's every book that's worthy. Here's a million dollars for it. That comes out from a fund that the whole nation invests in. And you get to that. You don't need the bookstores. You don't need the wealthy to be able to buy it and the poor right. to wait for it at the libraries. Everybody should have access to it. It's the same idea with art, right? So many of yeah. the best art in the world is sitting in somebody's private collection, never to see the light of day. Right. When it was never meant for that. It was meant for the world to react to it, not the one billionaire yeah. to put it in his, uh, over his hot tub or something. For sure. And like you say, like even like, uh, e even the books that are on the shelf that we've read in the, my local book club, like we did digital copies so we could all see it and we could all mm -hmm. look at it that way. It wasn't the shel book on my shelf. So <laughs> it was right. you see what I mean? So the digital copy. Yeah. Right. But, uh, Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I, uh, like I say, like with the person who writes about sustainability, but then is flying around the country, that's clear. That's clearly hypocritical, right? Like they've crossed that line where you go, okay, well now you, you you put your well being and your promotion, self promotion above the, the mission, right? But what do you say about like, uh, somebody who is publishing with a small publishing house, but who, so there's print copies and whatnot, and they still do book tours, but they don't do it quite in that way. They say go around uh, through, you know, regular, like maybe less toxic forms of travel to promote the ideas in the book because the ideas right. are what's important. Okay. Very simple. Um, you should be advocating for a shift of culture. So right now we have this culture where 
you know, uh, authors uh, make their ways into bookstores and do the signings and the readings and they interact with their clients and with their readers, with their audience and all of those things, right? And they get speaking engagements through that and that helps them and their causes and whatnot. Today in a digital world where we have realized, uh, you know, grace to go COVID. I mean, before COVID, nobody would have dared said this. We can have this conversation. We can have the podcast, right? I mean, before this, I would have had to show up at your studio in physically to be there to have a conversation. Otherwise, like, I can't talk to this guy on FaceTime and post it because that's just wrong. Nobody would listen to it. It's illegal, essentially, you know, from up here. It's like, no, it's a it's an X. So we did it, though. COVID forced us to manage multi-billion dollar industries from our living rooms and right. home offices and all those places, right? And it forced us to have, uh, you know, to, to do our work from home. I mean, you know, parents and families and single people, whatever, they were sitting at home with their laptop at the office, essentially. Whereas you wouldn't dare do that. Even if you did all of your work every day, your boss would fire you at the end of the week if you didn't show up that week, even if you did everything perfectly. So today we have a change in culture. Use that. Tell your audience, look, I'm doing a live at 4 p.m. at this place, this time, whatever. Uh, join. You can have the same report. You know, you're not doing anything physical. You know, you're not yeah. touching people. You're, there, there's no physicality involved in your uh, book reading or your art or anything that you need to be there in person. So, yeah. um, you know, do it. Do it in a different way. So there you cut the community, you cut the travel, you cut all of these things and you cut, it's not just your travel. People say the carbon footprint of, you know, the author, they're not taking a charter flight anymore. They're traveling economy or better yet, they're taking the train or the bus or they're driving an electric car. That's fine. I grant you that. But where you, that bookstore that you're going to be in, in LA, for example, is attracting 200 people to come to that bookstore. How are they coming there? Yeah, they are yeah, using exactly. some source of travel to come there and go back, right? So that itself is also creating carbon, which is on you because it's your event. So if you yeah. have that meeting at home and everybody's sitting at home, the entire carbon that you're putting out there is the internet connections from all the 200 people that are uh, streaming with you. So yeah, you, you need think to that'd take, be substantially less, right? Right. So, so you need to change the ways that you're interacting and make those naturalized and normal. I remember Coldplay, uh, you know, the, the lead singer from Coldplay, he had in the pandemic, he sat in his uh, living room and had a mini concert for people and people, you know, tuned in and there was millions of people who did. He was doing this as a relief for people kind of, you know, going through the lockdowns yeah. and stuff. It was just as beautiful and amazing. Uh, you know, maybe not just as, but very close to amazing and very intimate feeling because you're so close, you know, in in, in, yeah. in the video and everything. And it's so raw and kind of acoustic and, and beautiful to experience that. And uh, you can do that. You don't need to have a huge um, live venue, uh, you know, tour going around the world. And it's just it's just too much for the problems we're having today. If granted, yeah. if if we didn't have these problems and if we weren't facing extinction and if we weren't in this situation of the future that is coming, uh, you know, deteriorating in the ways that we know it is, it's no longer, you know, a myth or a conspiracy or anything. We know we're deteriorating in at some levels. I'd say have it. It's beautiful. Get everybody together in the car. Have Woodstock. It's lovely. It's beautiful. Right. Have Live Aid, but not when Woodstock leads to death. Go yeah. to the concert and the next morning, guillotine. No, I won't go to the concert. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and like you say, like, it makes me think of, like, the, the Taylor Swift uh, phenomenon that's going on right now where, like, she, when she puts on a concert in a town or a city, like, there's, like, 50,000 extra people show up in that city. And mm -hmm. you'll, like, so how big is the, like, even if you take out her own carbon footprint, her own you know, unsustainable model, like, like I say, 50,000 people traveled out from however far away right. to come and see that show. At so, that point, it becomes a question of exactly, like I said, if this is such a big factor to our uh, immediate problems of the world, right? At that point, we start thinking, how valuable is that music? And right. is it, is it music at the end? Is it art? Because, you know, art is not destructive. One of the qualities of art is it can't be destructive. 
it has to be something that engages the mind. So if you are essentially destructive in your art, then you're not an artist. You know, that, that's one yeah. thing I, I always I always say. And, and you know, this isn't about Taylor Swift. I mean, people pick right. on her because, again, she's famous now. She's she's the person. But there was a Taylor Swift when Madonna was, uh, you know, rising through the ranks when she was in her 20s and 30s. There was a yeah. Taylor Swift when Whitney Houston was rising through her ranks and many other people before them and yeah. after Taylor Swift. So it's not Taylor Swift. It's the system. It's the way that yeah. the system is managed for profit. You're not going to get a billion dollars out of Taylor Swift without the mechanism of the motions that are going right now. You're not going to make a billion dollars out of Drake, uh, you know, without the ways that uh, the system works on that. So it is about profit. But if we learn to transition this art to compassion, imagine, you know, um, Live Aid was was a really big concert to to help, uh, you know, in the 80s uh, to help uh um, AIDS and, and, and awareness and, you know, uh, fundraising for it and whatnot. Um, I don't see a banner in, for example, you mentioned Taylor Swift and Taylor Swift or many uh, people's uh, right. concerts right bang in front of the, on the tickets and in front of the shows and everywhere and on the screens and everything about awareness to a cause or something that even triggers their music. A lot of these people, you know, uh, take rap. A lot of it is about the inner struggle, urban struggles of, uh, you know, major metropolitan cities in the United States and mm-hmm. racism and, you know, the black community and cultures within that. And so how many of them are publicly taking their music to invest into change versus buying, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that the music Fancy is about. Fancy cars today. or what have yeah, you. The, the, yeah, the stuff that this, because 80s rap is not today's rap. Right, right, yeah. Right, so, so that that was different. That's why Tupac still survives in the music till today, right? right? Everybody yeah. respects that music because that music was about what touches everybody still today in their heart. Whereas, yeah. you know, you bring if you bring a song from today, uh, you know, that's talking about buying a Bugatti 30 years from now where, you know, things have changed and Bugatti's out and there's a new something. People are Nobody's like, oh, going to care. What, yeah. what, is, what is that? I, don't, I, can't, I cannot relate to that. But yeah. when you bring... Tupac, and he talks about some pain, you know, you relate to that still 50 years later, which is why you still read some of the books that were written a thousand years ago, whereas you don't read something that was written in 1984, which was a bestseller about, you know, how to be successful, the best investment. And nobody reads that anymore, even though it was a bestseller, but it was only 20 years ago. But you read stoicism that was, you know, centuries ago. Right. Marcus Aurelius, centuries ago, you still read about that. Even though he was wrong about some things, we still read like yeah, Aristotle. Exactly. And like... <laughs> yeah, I know. Even, a lot of yeah. them were wrong about a lot of things in placed in context today, but they raised the moral issues that everybody goes through and fights, right? Yeah. Kant was not, Nietzsche was not even right about everything, but you know, um, there is value because it triggers you to even say that it triggers you to say, Hey, they were wrong about this or that, or I want to yeah. challenge this concept there. Right. So it yeah. moves you to become more uh, moralistic or ethical in your perspective or to defend the ethics that you're trying to compose. Whereas sure. today it's just about the sales. It's just about how many <laughs> books can we push out? How many you know songs can we yeah. download from this? And, and that's what it comes down to. Yeah. For sure. And that goes to compassivist, right? That's compassivist. To to shift that mentality, when you ask me about, you know, my political view or my social view, it's shifting that mentality to use Taylor Swift as a proponent for change and betterment and making the world a better place as opposed to using her for uh, you know, clothing, for makeup, for trends, for fashion, for selling tickets for Super Bowl half times and things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, I was actually thinking like we're, we're coming up on just about 45 minutes. So it's probably a good idea to like flesh out compassive East, maybe a little bit more. Like, uh, I don't know if we got the full picture of it. Well, um, compassive East. So imagine an octopus, um, you know, there, the reason why I mentioned the octopus is the tentacles work, um, in unison to achieve a goal. They're not independent. So just like, uh, you know, human arms, uh, when you try to 
um, raise a glass with two hands. You know, the two hands are working together to raise the glass in a different way than if you were trying to raise the glass in one hand. So your hands function through the brain that tells the hands what is happening and what they should do to achieve that final goal of raising the glass together. So the eight tentacles, for example, our music program is not about uh, just the music on its own. It's about what is the purpose of driving music so that we can include it in through the foundation to support the causes and to support the changes that we want to infrastructurally and socially that we can advance the world to betterment. So um, we have the publishing house, which essentially started because I had a an offer for a uh, for my books uh, with uh, a big publishing company, and I have thirteen of them now, um, and. Uh, essentially, I said no, because one, they wanted the print mandated in there with the tour and all of those things. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm an advocate for stuff against this. I'm not doing this. Then they wanted to change some of the message and, and, and the expression. I said, no, this is mine. And then, you know, they want to own the rights. I said, we can't do that because I'm not taking any profit from my books. You know, Compassivis, all of its arms are uh, not for profit. And essentially, right. you know, it's a co-op social structure that feeds all of the uh, profit, what's called profit, into the foundation to share with the communities. So how am I going to uh, give you the rights if the es essence of this book is meant for this purpose? And you love the ideas of the book because it explains that. So you want to say, let's tell the story as a fable, but take the profits, you know? Yeah. Let's, yeah. You know, so, and I can't do that. So then I started Compassive Publishing because of that. So that's uh, how it started. And what we do is we, all of our authors keep their books. So you, you write a book, you submit it to us. We say, we like it. We're going to publish you. We will market you. We will spend the money to do all of that. But you keep the rights of the book. You take 50%, we take 50%. The 50% that we take goes directly into the causes. So it's not profit. Okay. And your 50%, you can go buy your Ferrari with it if that's your mentality. But we hope not. But you could. It's your right to do whatever you want. But right. what... The idea here is that, you know, we don't enslave you and we don't push you and we don't force you to sit there and try to make profit out of your book. Go out there, you know, play your social media, push it, you know, push this book out. Like we're not, I'm not the kingpin trying to make sure that my peddlers are pushing out the drug as fast as possible for me to make the bigger chunk of the profit. So that's not the model that we're in. You know, right. it's a communal model. Then, you know, the art program is the same thing. So we're developing these art, art capsules where uh, people uh, go into them and, and enjoy them as part of the kitchen capsule, which is, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. And if you submit your art and, you know, we put it there with uh, whether it's digital or, or print and we place it there and, and we have themes and people come in and look at those and we spark discussions and we spark people's, uh, you know, meditative and ruminating thoughts about the art that's placed there. And they leave. It's not for sale. It's for the whole public to view. The donations that we raise from these capsules then get divided uh, amongst the artists that are involved in the program based on their capacity okay. of involvement, whether you have 10 pieces or one piece or whatnot, so that they can continue their expressionism as opposed to me calling them and saying, hey, uh, you know, Joe, Mary, um, I, uh, we really need dolphins this month. Like, you guys got to do me dolphins because, you know, that's trending and it's big. And remember that dolphin that they saved off the coast of, you know, somewhere and they pushed it back in the water. It's, it's really pushing dolphin sales and everything dolphin. So uh, make dolphins and, and Joe and Mary go and start painting. It's not about that. You do whatever you right. want. Tell us. And then we will package those into categories where we know, okay, we have 10 things that everybody's talking about. I don't know. Uh, the crucifixion, you know, so we'll we'll have that, uh, the Jesus, the crucifixion, let's spark a discussion about that. How are we going to approach that? And then we create those capsules. That's one. Uh, the okay. second one. The third one is the kitchen, where we try to educate people in a kitchen um, uh, in different parts of the world, uh, where you learn about food. In essence, uh, you know, a lot of people know fast food's not good for you today, but you learn really about the ins and outs of food from professionals and about you know, how you are eating in the sense of the carbon impact of it as well. So like we okay. said earlier, you know, you, you could be like, oh, I'm having avocado, I'm having, you know, almonds and this and that. Well, find out how much destruction this is causing to animals as well. Right. And find right. out find out when you eat 
stuff that are out of season. So, if, you know, it's, it's not strawberry season, but you're having strawberries, find out the impact of that because it's not in your vicinity. It's not in your locality. It's coming from somewhere very far. Find out about the legal uh, aspects of that, the slave labor that's going on in those farms. Where is it coming from? All those things before you eat that strawberry and think, oh, delicious, you know. Um, right. Eat local, yeah. understand your farms, all of that. And the food is free because they're sponsored by the local community and it's vegan. So all our farms sponsor it. They provide the foods. We have uh, you know, celebrity local chefs who come and create the menu based on the food of the region. And so you have an event, you have, you know, it's it's there for weeks and basically people interact with it. They learn about food and this education goes away with them. So the next day when they're in a supermarket aisle, they're no longer looking at that aisle in the same way as they used to mm. before. They're not looking mm. at even the organic section in the same way they're looking at it before. They're looking at it with a critical mind now. So, and what we do there is we, um, you know, uh, the hungry, the homeless, anybody is is uh, invited to join and uh, you know in in the spaces uh, to eat and to That's be awesome. among the people. There's no there's no uh, rich and poor here. There's no Michelin stars that we're getting. We're uh, you know we're giving everybody uh, food and we also create food packages for uh, animal shelters and places that are uh, unable to provide uh, quality food for the animals as much as we can and as much as as long as we're there. Uh, and also teaching people about pet foods because a lot of people at home, even the wealthy, uh, you know, they'll go to the pet store and buy the most expensive brand because it's the most expensive. It's got to be the best for my dog. So that's what I'm feeding my dog, not knowing that the majority of the stuff in there is poison for uh, your pet. And the majority of the pet food companies are owned by the pharmaceutical companies who then make the medication to uh, remedy the poison that is causing your animal to get sick. And that's Jeez. how the veterinary system works. So uh, we do all of that through that program. Again, uh, not for profit, all managed in that way. And everybody working in the environment are volunteers who sign up from, you know, time ahead so that we organize the whole thing. So those are, you know, some of the arms that uh, essentially do. And then we have the brain of the operation, which is label your carbon. Um, and that is a movement that's spearheading um, the um, restaurant industry, the uh, tourism, hotels, and aviation industry, and, and branching out into products. And basically what we're doing is we're getting a label for the carbon footprints of products so that the competition on product sales becomes more critical in the understanding of the sustainability. So if you have Pepsi and Coca-Cola and both of them have a little label and they say eight grams of carbon, and one says eight, one says seven, people are just generally because they're looking to be the better human are going to go and pick the people seven. With this, yeah. Slightly right. Smaller. And then what's going to happen? Right. The person with the Coca-Cola is now going to say, hey, guys, why are we losing sales? You know, the team's going to come back and say, because we're at eight and they're at seven. They're like, OK, we need to get a five. And they're going to spend the money there on R&D to get to five. When they get to five, Pepsi is going to say, God darn, OK, we need to get to three now. And it's going to bring it down to that minimum. Turn their own they're... capitalist mindset right. against them. <laughs> exactly. So that's what Label Your Carbon is about. And, you know, we have an app for people to be involved. And we're also in the gaming industry where we're coming out with a game soon, uh, mobile game, and it's expanding into um, a bigger uh, perspective of that uh, to involve gaming into uh, the world in a sense to uh, raise awareness for environmental issues and social issues through gaming, as opposed to imagine, uh, you know, some of those violent uh, games with mafias and killings and things like that, but reverse it uh, where you, yeah. you rise, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you get, uh, as you become a better human, as opposed to a worse human. So you have these difficult decisions to make where you have to be like, ah, I, I really want to kill this person to get this point here or whatever, but the better thing to do is to save that person there. So, okay, I do that and you get more points and, 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 and it takes it from there. So huh. those are all the, uh, all the arms of um, Compassivist, so to speak, uh, you know, and we have our websites, uh, CompassivistFoundation.org, the charity where 
uh, our causes are up there on a monthly basis and people can go there, they can donate, they can volunteer, they can be involved. We have capacitiespublishing.com where you can submit your books, you can buy our books. And we have, we have quarterly anthologies that come out of there. And essentially those are meant uh, to ignite people's thoughts every three months about something, about a major issue that we think people should listen to and, and, and collaborate with. And, uh, you know, we have uh, Compassivis, which is essentially um, a lot of our writings as a blog, so to speak, uh, to ignite um, the thoughts. And we have Compassivis Dialogues, which is the final part. And Compassivis okay. Dialogues is what we're doing right now. But see, in this show and in many shows, it is about the guest and the guest's views and the guest's right. uh, ideology and all that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a dialogue where... I will sit with you, I'll sit with Corey, and Corey will tell me about anarchism. And I will say what my thoughts are about anarchism, and Corey can tell me what his thoughts are. And we can have a conversation just like we're at a coffee shop. And in that conversation, it's no longer uh, Corey talking about anarchism and the guest taking that bit that Corey said, but it's more about, hey, there's two sides, there's two sides to the coin, and this is what Corey said, this is what Ali said, and it's triggering my thoughts, and it's triggering my ideology, and I'm right. more on Corey's side. Or, you know what, they're really saying the same thing, they're just calling it differently, so at the end of the day, this is good, you know, uh, this yeah. is what I'm taking from it. So it's more of like a dialogue situation where we're bringing on uh, different types of people from, you know, people who are trying to make change in the world, people who have made a lot of change in the world, people, everyday heroes, all, all sorts of mixes. It's not, um, again, very decentralized in that way. It's not about bringing a celebrity on so that you get ratings. It's about uh, a show people can relate to. That's awesome. Is there That's like a... Is there is there like a, a membership or something so that, that people can sign up to see that stuff? Yeah, so everything is open for people to see everything they want to see. Um, and what we will have is once the Label Your Carbon program kicks off, we're going to have a section, a platform, uh, where that is where the sign-up uh, space is, uh, the membership is. And what happens there is you sign up because you're allowed to now activate your causes through the app. And what that means is imagine a LinkedIn for activism. So Corey, you know, it has his book uh, club. Um, what does he do there? You know, this is what he does there. He wants to get more people involved. So he posts the time that the people are there. He posts the location and whatever, whether it's digital or whether it's physical. And now everybody can know about it in his five mile radius and they can join where they couldn't have before because not everybody would have known Corey's Instagram, even if he posted it there. But on this right. platform where you have, you know, 100 million people joined, it's very easy, kind of like Uber, uh, to find a car, right? because there's so many drivers and so many people looking for a car all around the world. So it becomes easy to locate. And so if you create that model where activism is as easy to locate as a car uh, that'll take you from A to B, then you can be the person who takes, you know, goes A to B to reach uh, that cause and to escalate that cause into, you know, the right space that it should be, because that's what you're involved in. So that's where the uh, membership comes. And, um, you know, it's free. But uh, the reason we have it set up that way is to have more accountability on the people posting stuff and what causes they're raising and, you know, being able that's to fair. Uh, make sure that it's ethical in a sense, because we don't want to, we don't want to create a platform where a Nazi comes and says, Hey, we're having, you know, uh, a pro Nazi movement here. And then right. everybody within a five mile radius and more show up there. So um, yeah. that that's, that's the reason for the membership, essentially a gatekeeping policy. Fair enough. So I guess uh, we kind of already told people where they can find you, but I guess we better just to make sure, uh, where what is the website where can people find compassive east the easiest is what you just said compassive east.com so it's c-o-m-p-a-s-s-i-v-i-s-t-e.com um, that's the starting point you can start there browse your way through that you'll find links and you'll find uh you know ways to get around into the other uh websites and and just go down that rabbit hole and um you know find the space where you uh fit in essentially and and, and stay there Right on. Is there, uh, there's, uh, are you guys on uh, social media of any kind? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're on uh, social media. So we're on all of the major ones and uh, you know, it's at 
capacities, obviously. And uh, that's what it is. And it was easy to get because it was a new word. Nobody, nobody right. had thought about it. So, you know, there was no problems there. I didn't have to call someone and beg. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's easy. Uh, so we're there. And uh, again, um, you know, we, we do uh, post some of our beliefs, our thoughts, uh, some issues and stuff. But it's, uh, it's not, um, like I said, you know, earlier, Compassivis is about you. It's about Corey. It's not about following. So it's about taking the uh, mindset of I need to find ways to switch from uh, my you know capitalist mindset, not in the social capitalist order system, but in the you know the opportunism that's in our heads that we always look for profit in something. I need to get that out, and I need to replace it with compassion. So I need to replace it with mindfulness. I need to you know, to become Buddha in a sense, you know, or Jesus, to, to, to change myself into those people. Or, uh, right. you know, even more recently, you know, you, you look at uh, Rosa Parks, for example, Gandhi, you know, p- people who have made change that doesn't necessarily benefit them, but it benefits the world, right? right. And uh, for many of them, it didn't. I mean, Martin Luther King caught a bullet benefiting USA. Yep. But, uh, you know, I, I don't see as much praise for him as some other people who, uh, you know, scored a winning goal in a uh, finals or something. So um, th- th- those are the things that need to be, th- that Compassive yeah. is about. So it's about you. You can follow us, you can share with us, you can interact with us, you can engage with us, you can be part of our programs, you can join uh, all of our programs, uh, you know, and see where they're happening, what's going on and all of that. That's great. Please show up, please uh, interact. But at the end of the day, it's about you going inside here, inside yourself, you know, inside your heart, inside your mind and making the difference. And that's how you kind of grow into Compassive Beast. Right on. So I guess uh, thank you very much for your time today. And it was a oh, very, very great me. conversation. <laughs> thank you very much. It was awesome. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, Or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. do something about uh, explaining that, explaining where the government of the self, the rule of the self starts with compassion. And you can elaborate because you will have all of you know, the, the, the education behind that to kind of express that mentality. And we can merge it with the idea of why the state systems of efficiency are essentially, you know, draconian systems that are dangerous uh, to 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 emotion, to to care, to compassion, sure. to anything that's human. And uh, you know, maybe people start thinking about that a little bit, thinking about, uh, you know, when when you're working in in that uh, model, because capitalism today is like that.